Francis Bacon was born one of five children in Dublin on the 28th of October, 1909. The son of Edward Bacon and his wife Christina, he was not of Irish blood. The family lived in and near Dublin because his father, a horse trainer, was employed there. By the late 20s, Francis Bacon had settled in London after traveling through Europe and was making a fitful living as a designer of furniture and rugs and as an interior decorator. In the August 1930 edition of Studio, under the heading, The 1930 Look in British Decoration, is to be found a note on Bacon's work with illustrations of the furniture and rugs he designed and of the interior of his studio. It's interesting to see that the tubular base of one of his tables bears a close resemblance to the kind of railing that encloses some of his papal and political executive figures of the 50s, and the rugs hanging on the facing wall have abstract designs. These bear at least some resemblance to the paintings he was doing at the time. It was never his intention to spend his life as an interior decorator. In the late 20s and 30s, it was difficult for unknown painters to survive. Art dealers were mainly preoccupied during the Depression with ensuring the survival of their established artists. Ever since he left home, he had been fascinated by reproductions of paintings. But his beginning as a painter dates from a visit to a Picasso exhibition in Paris in 1926. He returned to England, a painter in his heart. His earliest paintings, in watercolor or gouache, although related to his designs for rugs, included elements drawn from both late Cubism and surrealism. By the end of 1929, he had begun, however, to paint in oils such romantic subjects as dead trees in landscape. The dead trees were followed by paintings inspired by Picasso's most surrealist phase of the late 20s. But the organizers of the International Surrealist Exhibition held in London in 1936 considered his work not sufficiently surrealist for inclusion. Several of his earliest paintings are now destroyed and presented here as black and white pictures. The classification of Francis Bacon's work is sometimes confusing due to the many triptychs and versions of the same subject. They are nonetheless presented by year and number. Bacon began to paint without having received any instruction whatsoever. Considering that such work as painting was made within a couple of months of his beginning to paint in oils, and that he was entirely untrained, and that he was no more than 23 or 24 when he made Crucifixion, it is plain that he possessed extraordinary natural talent. Even his earliest works are marked by conspicuous intelligence and an innate capacity for the actual application of paint. In 1936, he painted an abstraction from the human form, a preliminary version of the center panel of the Tate triptych, three studies for figures at the base of a crucifixion, which was painted eight years later. It was while living in a city threatened with periodic death and destruction that Bacon set to work on this first major painting of his career. In the Tate triptych, Bacon incorporated the expressive distortions learned from Picasso and the violent subject matter absorbed from the Surrealists in an image that is wholly original in its shrill potency. The snarling teeth of the central figure and the wailing mouth of the one on the right establish with precision central elements of Bacon's imagery. In its illusion, the painting reaches well beyond the horror of our time to invoke not only the treachery of the crucifixion, but also the vengeful pursuit of the wicked by the Furies, who had been recast as flies two years earlier in Jean-Paul Sartre's play Les Mouches. 
While the crestfallen female of the left panel is clearly a mourner at the cross, her bestial companions defy strictly human interpretation, their barbaric and enraged forms agitating the triptych. During the years 1937 until 1944, he painted as little as one painting a year. This sterility was no doubt due mainly to the war. He served full-time in civil defense in Chelsea, but also to his disappointment about the failure of the exhibition he held in 1934. Whatever the merits of his earlier works, it is beyond question that this triptych expresses the imagination of the artist with an authority that belongs to none of its predecessors. The theme is evidently one that he had pondered long and deeply, for he took it up in 1944 exactly where he had left off the study, since destroyed, that he had made in 1936. This was followed in 1945-46 by two paintings of ever greater power, Figure Study 2, generally known as the Magdalene, which is surely one of his finest paintings. The lowered head with screaming mouth appears in a crouched figure sheltered by an umbrella. Paralleling the ribs of the umbrella above, the blade-like fronds of a tropical plant radiate beneath the chin of the figure, as though visible evidence of the piercing, vibrating sound. The second painting, Figure Study 1, is a work of comparable imaginative force, which probably just predates it. A third painting, Figure in a Landscape of 1945, is the first in which he invokes the sense of calamity that became so conspicuous a feature of his art. This picture was triggered by a pair of utterly disparate photographs. An image of Eric Hall dozing, seated backwards on a chair in Hyde Park, had collided in Bacon's imagination with an agitated news photo of a wartime dictator screaming into a microphone. In the painting, the figure's head is drastically displaced, swooping toward the microphones. The orator here becomes a brutal figure of gristle and hair, blood and bones. The lush lawns of Hyde Park are rendered parched and hostile, with the grass and shrubbery of the landscape described by short, stab-like strokes of black, brown and dark blue across the unprimed tan canvas. Only the pasted blue band of sky alleviates the charred and ominous mood. With these four works and painting 1946, Bacon attained a sudden and formidable maturity. His rejection of Christianity is not incompatible with an obsession with the crucifixion that has endured for more than two decades, and the fact that it forms the subject of one of his latest major works tells us that it has not lessened its hold. While painting 1946 began as an image of a bird lighting on a field, it evolved into a study of a powerful brooding figure who presides with dark ceremony over a scene of slaughter. The figure's neck is huge and bull-like, his upper lip vivid red, as if stained with the blood of the raw meat on the railing. The umbrella, familiar in surrealist paintings and in the daily life of England, calls to mind the wartime figure whose emblem it became, Neville Chamberlain. No paintings survive from 1947, but late 1948 and throughout 1949, Bacon completed a series of six heads in preparation for a one-man exhibition in London. In Head One of 1948, elements of traditional portraiture coexist with loose, spontaneous brushwork. The gold railing, the pentameno of a human head, and the suggestion of shoulders indicate that the painting was conceived as a portrait. In Head Three of 1949, the hazy image of a man looking over his shoulder floats as though projected on a heavy curtain. This apparition 
stares penetratingly at the viewer in Bacon's first rendering of eyes since the early 1930s. In Head 6 of 1949, Bacon created a cube-like structure that frames and concentrates the human subject. Described in rapid and economical strokes, the figure screams in the seclusion of the claustrophobic space. With this painting, Bacon introduced the imagery that would dominate his work for the next eight years, a figure isolated in a room, unaware of being observed at a moment of crisis or collapse. As Bacon had updated the image of Pope Innocent X in Head 6, so in Fragment of a Crucifixion of 1950 did he secularize the crucifixion. Pursued by a creature climbing over the blue cross, the shrieking figure in flight from this scene of agony could not be farther from the traditional image of the tragic savior at the moment of ultimate sacrifice. In this picture, Bacon has introduced for the first time a more or less unrelated street scene in the distance. Popes 1, 2, and 3 painted during the fall of 1951, constitute Bacon's first papal series. While the figure derives from Velazquez's painting, the dark ecclesiastical setting was drawn from a contemporary photograph of Pope Pius XII. The three paintings represent his first effort to show the successive actions of a single figure in a series of works. Pope I, is a relatively static image. The face of Pope II is blurred, and Pope III's features are almost indistinguishable. Bacon observes that the open mouth subjects might just as well be yawning, coughing, sneezing, laughing, or talking. Pope II, 1951. This picture, which is sometimes known as Pope Shouting, was actually painted first and followed by Pope I and Pope III in that order. However, Bacon confirms that he intended from the beginning to paint a series of three works. With the study after Velazquez's portrait of Pope Innocent X of 1953, Bacon reinvented Velazquez's image both formally and thematically, by tempering the composed grandeur and distant self-confidence of the 17th century painting with the blurred spontaneity and instability of the 20th century photograph. Retaining the structure of the staid Baroque prototype, the pose, the attire, the throne, and the setting, he tightens the relaxed hands into bald fists and incorporates the open mouth and mangled pince-nez from Eisenstein's screaming shot. Study for Crouching Nude, 1952. Muybridge's photographs frequently show a naked figure in action in front of a wire fence, which has numbers along the bottom, somewhat in this fashion. However, the figure in this picture was not derived from Muybridge. Three Studies of the Human Head of 1953, painted in August-September, was not initially conceived as a series, yet they became Bacon's first triptych exploration of the human head and document the mounting excitement of the figure. His mouth opening wider and his face increasingly wild and blurred as he collapses. The grassy habitat became the setting for the study of a baboon of 1953. Its subject's jaw opened wide, yawning or screaming like the popes that preceded it. Pressed toward us, rather than separated from us, by the fence that veils the branches and landscape beyond, this wild creature seems to share with us the landscape space of a zoo or game preserve. In Man with Dog of 1953, the ghostly dog is linked by a leash to a shadow figure suggested only by the hazy outline of legs and feet. The park walk along a pavement beside a curb and sewer grate 
a dark wall behind them cutting diagonally across the picture like the background grid of the Mewbridge photograph. In their elusiveness, the man and dog recall the moving figures whose fleeting presence was recorded in early slow exposure photographs. The hexagonal setting of Dog of 1952 will reappear in Sphinx in 1953. In Two Figures of 1953, the bedroom took its place alongside the papal chamber with Bacon's first painting of Two Figures Making Love. Two Figures is perhaps his most significant and enduring application of a Muybridge photograph. Two Figures in the Grass, 1954. Painted in February in a furnished room at 19 Cromwell Road, this work was previously known as Study from the Human Figure. Man in Blue 5, 1954. Bacon painted seven pictures, Man in Blue 1 to 7, partly from a model, while staying in the Imperial Hotel. The sitter was a man he met in the hotel. It is symptomatic of the ambiguity of much of his work that the man has been interpreted both as a victim and as a kind of ruthless interrogator. Monkey, 1955. Study for Portrait Two, 1955. The idea of painting heads of William Blake was suggested to Bacon by a young composer who asked him to design a cover for his song circle. He took Bacon to the National Portrait Gallery to see the plaster cast made after J.S. DeVille's famous life mask of William Blake of 1823, and they bought several photographs of it. Study for a Portrait of Van Gogh II of 1957. Bacon took up the theme of Van Gogh walking for a second time early in March 1957 and began to execute a series of pictures in a frenzy of work. They were all more closely based on Van Gogh the painter on the road to Tarascon. Taking his cue from the diagonal established by the artist and his shadow in the painting of 1888, in the second variation, Bacon tilts the road intensifying the effect of instability created by the harsh palette and the tumultuous application of paint. Study for Portrait of Van Gogh III, 1957. With Van Gogh III, this haunted figure on the road, like a phantom of the road, sinks into the landscape as figure and ground merge with the painterly figure. His hat extends a field of yellow his body parallels the trees in color and handling, and his feet virtually melt into the seething road. Study for a Portrait of Van Gogh 6 of 1957. Lying Figure, 1958. Miss Muriel Belcher, 1959. Though cataloged as head of woman number four, this is now known to be a portrait of Muriel Belcher, who ran the Colony Rooms, a well-known meeting place for artists and writers in Soho. She had been a friend of Bacon's for some twenty years. Tightly framed by the green panel that isolates her from the expanse of darker green above, the lively face of this unflappable friend seems caught in passing, so far does the top-heavy composition stray from the conventions of traditional portraiture. Study for Three Heads, 1962. Study from Innocent X, 1962. This has sometimes been known as Red Pope, Red Pope on Dais, or Red Figure on a Throne. Three Figures for a Crucifixion, 1962. Though Bacon visualized the forms in place before he began, they changed continuously. To begin with, he worked on the canvases separately, 
But later, as he brought them near to completion, he worked on the three together. It is a picture that he painted in about a fortnight when he was in a dark period of drinking, and he did the painting under the influence of tremendous hangovers and drink. He sometimes hardly knew what he was doing. Landscape near Malabata, Tangier, 1963. In the late 50s, Bacon had kept an apartment in Tangier, and a particular landscape near Malabata, which had intrigued the painter during his stays in North Africa, became the subject of a turbulent painting. In Crucifixion of 1965, the sense of struggle and urgency of the 1962 painting has subsided somewhat. The writhing figure has become a stiff-limbed carcass with splint-like bandages that suggest the frilly paper collars used by butchers to dress up joints of meat. Three figures in a triptych of 1964. Three studies for head of Isabel Rosthorn of 1965. The small triptych format of this portrait has proved an effective one for Bacon. The frontal and paired profile views like police records. Three studies for the portrait of George Dyer on a clear background of 1964. Bacon's probing portraits, however, could not be farther from the sleek, glamorized likenesses created by Warhol. One of Bacon's most poignant images, Portrait of George Dyer Crouching, of 1966, is at once a portrait of a friend and a pathetic image of modern man. While the pose and format are taken from Bacon's study for a crouching nude of 1952, which in turn was derived from Weebridge, the ambiguous structure that encircles Dyer recalls the tubs of Degas' bathing women. In Portrait of George Dyer Staring at a Blind Cord of 1966, a similar cubistic merging of profile and frontal views is used, suggesting the restless shifting of the figure. The robust flesh tones of the first portrait have drained away here, leaving a pallid figure punctuated by an impulsively hurled line of white pigment and framed by a faint linear cube. Dyer's face is similarly isolated by a rectangle illusionistically affixed to the wall by a long nail. Portrait of Isabel Rosthorn of 1966. Later, Bacon scrutinized the face of Dyer, this time along with that of their friend Isabel Rosthorn. Scraped, blotted, and dragged strokes of transparent and opaque paint coalesce to conjure with startling veracity the appearances of Dyer and Rosthorn. Three Studies of Isabel Rosthorn of 1967 Bacon had focused on Isabel Rosthorn in a number of previous paintings, including this one. The figure reaches toward an abnormally high lock, key in hand, glancing over her shoulder as though to spot pursuers. In the darkness beyond the door, she appears a second time, wearing gold earrings and perhaps a black dress in this lightless place. Pinned to the wall at the left is a third image of Rosthorn, its vertical striations mimicking the veiling of Bacon's figures during the 1950s and lining up with the stripes of the screen to which it is attached. Study for the Portrait of Isabel Rosthorn of 1964. Three studies of Isabel Rosthorn on a white background of 1965. Three studies of Isabel Rosthorn on a clear background of 1965.
Three Studies of Isabel Rosthorn of 1966. Study of Isabel Rosthorn, 1966. Portrait of George Dyer Speaking, 1966. Lying Figure of 1966. Three Studies of Muriel Belcher of 1966. Three Studies of George Dyer of 1966. Study for the Head of George Dyer of 1967. Portrait of George Dyer on a Bicycle of 1966. Portrait of Isabel Rosthorn standing in a street in Soho of 1967. Three studies for Isabel Rosthorn of 1968. Study for the heads of George Dyer and Isabel Rosthorn of 1967. In two studies for a portrait of George Dyer of 1968, a painted nude image of Dyer is nailed to a wall or canvas behind a clothed, seated figure of Dyer. The nails seem at once to affix a flat image to a wall, to wound the figure, and to invoke the illusionistic nails introduced by Brack into a number of still lifes around 1910. An impetuously flung streak of white paint slides down Dyer's leg as a similarly hurled handful of white paint had done in the 1966 portrait. Two studies of George Dyer with a dog of 1968. Three studies for a portrait of 1968. A pronounced ambiguity derives from the alternation of architecturally unrelated spaces in Sweeney Agonists of 1967. While the rooms shown at right and left are almost identical, they are separated by the jarringly dissimilar sleeping compartment of the central panel. In the two figures lying on a bed with attendants of 1968, the space is essentially continuous spanning the frames that divide the horizontal panorama into a trio of vertical paintings. Nestled together in parallel poses, the privacy of their room, guarded by Venetian blinds, closed on the daylight beyond, the central subjects of this picture are striking in their stillness and closure. But they are not alone, instead flanked by pendant figures, one nude, one clothed. Lying Nude of 1969 The subject of Bacon's first identified portrait, done in 1951, this painter and grandson of Sigmund Freud, appears in a full-length portrait triptych, Three Studies for a Portrait of Lucien Freud of 1969. Freud sits on a cane-bottomed chair like those in Bacon's studio, but the artist has also incorporated the headboard recorded in photographs of Freud sitting on a bed, a headboard that echoes the thrones of Bacon's popes. In each panel, Freud's face is divided by a vertical element of the cube structure that surrounds him. A similar bisection had obscured the face of Portrait of George Dyer in a Mirror of 1968. But here, the features of Freud are elucidated, since the skewed cube seems to multiply our vantage point prismatically. The concealed face of Dyer in the 1968 portrait is visible only in the massive television-like mirror 
its reflection broken in half, as if the speed of Dyer's motion had eluded even the mirror's ability to record. Double portrait of Lucien Freud and Frank Auerbach of 1964. Three studies for the portrait of Lucien Freud of 1965. Portrait of Lucien Freud on an orange background of 1965. Three studies for a portrait of Lucien Freud, 1966. This insinuation of voyeurs into the bedroom assumes a more conventional guise in Study of a Nude in a Mirror, 1969. The reclining nude woman was probably based on photographs of Henrietta Moraes, the subject of several other portraits of this year. The smiling man viewed in the mirror recalls the well-to-do suitors glimpsed backstage in Edgar Degas' images of dancers and the patrons of brothels in the works of Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Study of Henrietta Moraes of 1969. The reclining nude woman was probably based on photographs of Henrietta Moraes, the subject of several other portraits this year. Three studies of Henrietta Moraes of 1969. Three studies of Henrietta Moraes of 1969. Studies of George Dyer and Isabel Rosthorn of 1970. Three studies of George Dyer of 1969. Study for Bullfight No. 1 of 1969. Second version for Study of Bullfight of 1969. In a somber transformation of the wrestling nudes seen in so many images of the 1970s, Georges Dyer looks like a toppled boxer struggling with an unseen opponent in the left panel of Triptych of 1971. In the central panel, illuminated by the yellow glare of a bare bulb, a spectral figure of Dyer turns a key in a door. The spave is skewed, Caligari-like, as though seen through the eyes of the distraught Dyer as he gazes back toward the stairs and the window through which the night sky is seen. In the right panel, his image is silhouetted as a portrait bust before a tombstone-like block and mirrored in reverse in the reflective surface of a cafe table. Triptych, August 1972. Bacon confronted Dyer's death in works painted over several years. In the first of the black triptychs, a pair of figures wrestle perilously near the void of the doorway, the image of embrace transformed into a metaphor of mortal combat. The left and right panels each contain a seated figure facing to the right. The man at the left is Dyer. The one at the right resembles Bacon. While Dyer faces the combat with eyes closed and face still, the figure at right faces away from his companions in the adjacent panels. Three portraits. Triptych, posthumous portrait of George Dyer, self-portrait, portrait of Lucien Freud, 1973. Bacon is flanked by his closest friends in these pictures. A smear of paint pulled to the right of his head balances the hand to the left, with the two elements functioning like blinders to ward off the stares of his neighbors. Pinned to the wall are two photographs, 
behind Dyer, at the left, an image of Bacon, and behind Freud, at the right, a photo of Dyer. This incorporation of illusionistically rendered black and white photographs may be an acknowledgement of photography's memory-triggering role in Bacon's work and underlines the disparities between the fixity of photography, the flexibility of painting, and the subjectivity of perception and memory. Three Studies of a Man's Back of 1970 Studies of the Human Body of 1970 Bacon recoiled from the faces of his friends. He had earlier appeared in Studies from the Human Body, 1970, as an observer, shielded partially by the Curiosity animate camera. Its eyes agape, horns upright. He is watched by us as he watches the central nude figures, who are visually skewered by the railing encircling them. The unmodulated field of bright color against which the figures are seen and the neutral, undetailed spaces in which the action unfolds typify the settings of Bacon's paintings from about 1960 onward. In the central panel of three studies of figures on beds of 1972, the pair of nudes appear in a Duchampian scenario. The churning rotary motion suggested by the circles and arrows surrounding the figures of all three panels recalls the halting movements of the water wheel and chocolate grinder in Duchamp's pivotal image of frustrated mechanical love. The bare bulbs suspended over each of the figures can scarcely account for the black shadows that disturb the painting. The bad omen of these dark counterpoints of the figures is fulfilled in the second black triptych, May-June of 1973. The setting suggests instability, with the doorways of the side panels splayed outward and darkness seeping into the foreground. A bat-like shadow looms in the central panel, as though the illogical product of the bulb swinging wantonly above the figure and seems to be some grim messenger of death. Bacon had anticipated the juxtaposition of the voluptuous flesh of the body with its more enduring, if lifeless, skeleton in Three Figures and Portrait of 1975. The backbone of the figure at left protrudes elucidated like the spinal column of Giacometti's palace at 4 a.m. Circles, like lenses, or the radiographer's target indicated in Clark's book, lend focus to the figures, the slight distortion of George Dyer's face at left echoing the blurring created by the curve of optical glass. The similar exposure of the spine in figure writing reflected in a mirror of 1976 reflects the impact of Edgar Degas' After Bath of 1903. You must know the beautiful Degas pastel of a woman sponging her back, and you will find at the very top of the spine that the spine almost comes out of the skin altogether, and this gives it such a grip and twist that you're more conscious of the vulnerability of the rest of the body than if he had drawn the spine naturally up to the neck. In my case, these things have been influenced by X-ray photographs. The intertwined figures of Bacon's paintings embrace or struggle within the confines of this predicament. Studies from the Human Body, 1975. In Triptych, Studies of the Human Body of 1979, the nudes in the central canvas are flanked by two male figures derived from the nude figures of day and twilight that face each other on the tombs of Giuliano and Lorenzi de' Medici in Michelangelo's Medici's Chapel of 1519-1534. A gash mars the back of the left-hand figure in Bacon's painting, the one related to Michelangelo's day, as if to render human the marble-like flesh. In the central image, 
one figure's toothy mouth is mimicked by the broken line tangent to a knee at the right. Three Studies for Self-Portrait, 1983. During the past 15 years, Bacon has painted more than 20 self-portraits. The shrillness with which he described the exit from life in the black triptychs eased somewhat in his self-portraits and portraits of the next few years. By the start of the next decade, the sense of sadness that had dominated the work of the early 1970s gave way to a feeling of freshness in such images as Three Studies for a Portrait of John Edwards of 1984. When you're painting somebody, you know that you are, of course, trying to get near not only to their appearance, but also to the way they've affected you, because every shape has an implication. Study for a Portrait of 1970. Study for a Portrait of 1971. The confrontation with mortality that underlies so many portraits and triptychs of the 70s is amplified in a succession of works that draw on the imagery of painting 1946 and trace the gloomy course of the Furies. Second version of painting 1946 was made in 1971 when the Museum of Modern Art in New York seemed reluctant to lend the original version to the Grand Palais for Bacon's retrospective in Paris. The work of 1946 was finally made available for the show, but in the meantime, Bacon had recast the image to ensure its inclusion in one form or another in his exposition, from a vantage point transformed by the intervening 25 years. The composition is more clear and spare, the magenta background replaced by bright yellow. While the musculature of the arms of the split carcass is even more distinctly human than before, the central figure is, quite simply, a different person. Though the eyes remain obscured by the umbrella, his neck no longer bulges brutishly, and he's more relaxed, the growling mouth replaced by a more conversational arrangement of the lips. The laced boots worn by the figure are familiar from images of Lucian Freud and of Bacon himself. Neatly dressed, wearing a raincoat over his suit, he looks more like a banker off to lunch in the rain than a vivacious dictator shrieking at a crowd. The taming of the violent imagery of painting 1946 continues in Seated Figure of 1978, the figure is enclosed within the familiar linear cube, beyond which three pink shades with tassel poles reiterate the setting of both versions of painting 1946. But the carcass and the railings skewered with meat have been eliminated. The figure is now dressed in white cricketer's clothes, and his teeth protrude awkwardly rather than menacingly. Below this figure hovers a bust of George Dyer, ideally handsome. With the passing of time, the image of Dyer once again coheres. A cameraman, not Bacon, enters through a darkened doorway into rectilinear space of Triptych of March 1974, the final work of the Black Trilogy. Face and camera merge as they turn their sights toward us. In the left panel, a butcher described with Domiesque suppleness turns away from us toward a blackened wall and doorway, which mirror the architecture of the camera's space. A figure twists athletically in the central panel, an image of musculature and contraposto that is timeless, save for the bare light bulb suspended above. Five years later, after completing the second version of painting 1946, Bacon returned to the imagery of 1946 to create a triptych that again juxtaposed villain and victim. The central panel of triptych of 1976 revolves around the image of a headless figure, apparently painted on a canvas or reflected in a mirror. 
It is seated on a chair, its legs horrifyingly lively in their springiness. In pose and ashen pallor, this figure reads like a curious revamping of the headless, armless, godless, variously identified as Leto or Hestia of the 5th century BC, among the Elgin marbles in the British Museum in London. A bird of prey attacks the decapitated figure, while vulture-like creatures perch on railings. In its suggestion of a living human victim of a predatory bird, the image calls to mind the story of Prometheus. In the foreground, a bowl suggesting both a chalice and a toilet overflows, its contents blood red. The sleek lines and surfaces of the railing establish a counterpoint to the visceral forms of the human carrion and its attackers. At right and left, the faces of two men loom large, like propaganda posters. They are stony, ambiguous figures who seem implicated by their proximity and by their dispassion in the violence recorded in the center panel. The strange poster-like heads of triptychs of 1976 are echoed in triptych 1974-77 by the large heads that bracket a nude figure. The sky-blue background and sand-colored ground plane of the central image are restated in the beach settings of the side panels, each containing a figure elevated on a chair of wood and tubular construction and sheltered by a black umbrella. While the large heads were images that Bacon had often thought about, the horses and riders at left were an afterthought, incorporated for distance and movement. Landscape of 1978. The tenuousness of life is underscored in Bacon's repeated suggestion of the fragility of the human body. In no painting is this more eloquently expressed than in Study for Portrait of Michael Lyris of 1978. The skull-like depiction of Lyris's cranium at right, the broken white line that links Lyris's nose and ear, and the black ground against which the head is viewed offer compelling evidence that as Bacon considered the face of his friend, he remembered as well the photographs and x-ray images of Clark's book, which had long intrigued him. The dramatic difference in scale between the different horses and the heads was intensified in Statue and Figures in a Street of 1983. Tiny dark figures, akin to those that populate the paintings of French artist Henri Michaud, move along the street, dwarfed by the huge statue and by the even more vast plain against which it is isolated. The human figure is overpowered, as by the insistent repetitions and disproportionately vast scale of fascist architecture. Bacon's sense of the poignancy of our condition our helplessness in the face of an apparently indifferent universe inflects the paintings of the past decade and a half. The fragility of the human form is suggested with gentle introspection in Sleeping Figure of 1974, whose huddled subject seems considerably more ephemeral than his own shadow. The nullity of death was defied in Sphinx, Portrait of Muriel Belcher of 1979, as Bacon rendered his robust old friend during the year of her death in the guise of an ageless ancient creature. Within the context of these reveries on finality, the threshold assumes momentous importance in Bacon's art. As in the black triptychs and the Oresteia itself, the dark events of triptychs of 1981 inspired by the Oresteia of Aeschylus, are set before doorways. Part bird of prey, part mammal, the bloodied embodiment of the Uranese of Aeschylus, which for Bacon is an image of disaster, seems momentarily snared within the schematic spatial structure at left. Tireless pursuers of men, the Uranese appear with greatest clarity in a painting of 1974, 
seated figure. Dressed in black shorts, the seated figure twists his head away to escape the hideous creature who hovers at right. The four limbs and oddly fleshy wings of this predatory being shockingly identify, in retrospect, the shadowed presence in the central panel of Triptych, May-June of 1973, and call to mind Bacon's reflection that in modern life, the Irenees take the form of our private demons. An arrow points toward a bloodied opening in the body of the now familiar incarnation of the Furies in Oedipus and the Sphinx after Ingres of 1983. This repugnant creature is suspended beyond the doorway of the brightly lit room where Oedipus and the Sphinx meet, taking the place of Oedipus's companion in Ingres' painting of 1808. The black washes across the face and eyes of the heroically muscled figure of Oedipus. This foreshadows his blindness and distinguishes him from Ingres' clearly illuminated, pristine figure. Bacon's paintings are, in the end, about what we do in that space that we are allowed. We are born and we die, but in between, we give this purposeless existence a meaning by our drives. In Study of the Human Body of 1983, a spectral figure, legs straining as though at the end of a long climb, steps toward a doorway, arm reaching for the lock, calling to mind the macabre lingo of the chorus at the end of Eliot's Sweet Agonists. Early on, Bacon identified his subject matter, the raw facts of human existence. Tinged by his conviction that ours is a world devoid of any benevolent plan, his paintings defy the cosmic senselessness of our actions as they focus with vehemence, tenderness, remorse, and a plethora of other emotions on the private lives of their subjects. And it is with grandeur and a carefully metered formality that Bacon's paintings reinvent what we know, tearing away the veils 